for a, a Maybe we could go break some windows and then hire the homeless people to <laughs> That's fix them. That's not necessary. <laughs> we could hire people to break the windows in the first place and double our... Good idea! <laughs> You're a genius! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. So I, I hope think, you put that in there I think we it's have. hilarious. Yeah, that'll be in the... Uh, the uh, outtake reels. <laughs> yeah, my name's Chris Emerson. I'm the manager of the Manchester Homeless Services Center about two blocks from here. We're in downtown Manchester. And we average about 145 people per day who come into the center. Almost at 1,100 unduplicated unique individuals who have come in the place. Actually our highest numbers are in the summer, not the winter. Huh. Quite a number of our people will do anything to get out of town before the winter. So if they've got family or they'll scrounge a bus ticket, they just get out of here because they're legitimately and appropriately afraid of being outside in the cold because you can die. Is there a typical homeless person? Uh, do they have, there must be similar stories of how they get there. Are some people, one of the guys says since he was probably an adult, he's been basically on the streets for... Well, what you said is true and not true. There are quite a number of common features, but what I've discovered is every story is also unique. Um, the fact is that people become homeless because a number of problems, poor decisions, factors, bad luck, circumstances cascade. One thing leads to another. It's almost never one thing. Sure. Uh, so when people come in, they fill out an intake form, and we ask them, uh, why are you homeless? And there's about nine or ten different answers they can give. One of them is uh, uh, eviction. And another one might be mental illness. Another one could be job loss. Uh, another one could be a physical disability. Or they've been released from jail. Or there's trouble at home. Quite a significant percentage of our women are escaping forms of domestic abuse. Right. So they come here from another state and uh, they're just trying to get away. Uh, some people have trouble with the law. Uh, I know that a few of our people um, <laughs> might be wanted by the law in another state, so they're hiding out here and they're keeping undercover. I'm happy to help them because uh, I've always felt uh, truth is, uh, even a scoundrel deserves a break because you never know when today is the day when they start to turn it around. And if they're, if they're straight with me, uh, I'll give them every, every benefit of the doubt. And uh, so that there are a lot of common things that happen. The other major factor for a lot of folks, of course, is alcohol or drug abuse. It's huge. Absolutely mm -hmm. huge. And, uh, and what can happen is you, you hear the story of someone who is homeless. They're, they're doing pretty well, but then the guy loses his job. Then he's getting behind on his mortgage payments. Looks like he's going to lose his house. Along with that, his marriage falls apart. And then there's accusations of trouble inside the house. So he's out on the street. He's without a job. The house is going to be foreclosed. Wife and kids move back home with the family. He's alone. And then some of these guys will do the worst thing, is they'll turn to a bottle. Sure. You know, because they're going to anesthetize themselves. So those are the fortunate ones that they choose a legal drug. Right. And Although it is probably more damaging than some other prohibited substances. True. And some of them will try to, uh, some of the women will end up turning tricks. Some of them will try to, uh, you know, move some drugs around, deal some things. People become desperate. Uh, but it's never one thing. It's one leads to the next. It's like dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. And before you know it, I mean, I've had guys in there. Two years ago, they were pulling down uh, $80,000, $90,000 a year living in their own house. Now they're on the street. They got nothing. Mm. They have nothing. Right. And, hey, how you doing, Phil? I'm doing all right. And the, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that the most motivated people to get unhomeless are people who are the most recently homeless because they remember what it's like to have a job, to have a home, and the self-respect that goes with that. So if I get a guy who comes into my place and he's been on the street for uh, a month or a few weeks, he's going to do a absolutely everything he can to get any kind of a job, to get any kind of a place to live. 
How about, so the people that are recently homeless are more likely to they'll turn it around. Yeah, and because uh, uh, they're motivated, they're hopeful. The problem is when those few weeks turns into months and the months turn into a year or two. Uh, that's when you begin to watch a tragedy unfold because people begin to lose hope. But more than that, they begin to understand themselves to be homeless. It becomes their identity. Right? They develop the, the skills to survive on the street. They learn how to work in a city and find uh, like these backpacks or find a meal or find boots or find people to help them. They work and, and learn the system. They learn the system and they learn how to survive that way. And, and the equation that they go through in their head is, why should I try for yet another job and get rejected? Why should I try for a place uh, to live and find out I simply can't afford it? I am a successful homeless person. I know how to do this. And in a way, more power to them. In another way, what a tragedy. They've succeeded at surviving, but they have also decided that this is the person they are going to stay. And uh, that, that, to me, that, and they, they become what you call chronically homeless. Okay. And one more thing. Do you ever have um, some of the recently homeless to get back into a home? Uh, do you hear back from them? Do they come oh, yeah. back to help? Oh, they do. Oh, yeah. No, they'll often come in, and they're just so hot. They're, they're happy. They're saying, I got a place, or I got a job. Yeah, I'm going to come back and help and do this. Some of them do. Actually, I hope a lot of them don't, because where I am at the Homeless Services Center, this is not a destination. This is a, a great place to be from. Uh, this is meant to be a launching point for starting a new life. And uh, when they can come back, they can start to get back into the group of being homeless. And especially if they fought off any kind of an addiction or any kind of a debilitating emotional condition, you don't put yourself back in that situation. It's like a smoker. You don't go into the presence of smokers. Uh, recovering alcoholics don't go hang around a lot of people who drink. It's not always emotionally healthy for people who have broken out of homelessness to go spend a lot of time with people who are homeless. So even though I'm always happy to see them and congratulate them and support them, part of me says, don't come back here. This is a terrific place to be from. <laughs> and, and we do all we can for them to help. But it's not a great place to be. Second uh, backpack drop off, this is Amanda. Hi. And uh, <laughs> this time was a little different than the first time. How so? Um, well, we had more people come out this time. We had more activists come out this time to help, and we had more um, homeless folks come to get backpacks this time. So that was cool. A lot of times, uh, homeless kind of disappear into the, the scenery, and people kind of yeah. ignore them. Yeah, I found out today that um, at the New Horizon shelter, and there's a few shelters around town, but just at that one, which is the biggest one, from what I understand, they have over 100 people staying there every night. So they're not making it convenient for homeless people to be homeless. No, which, they have a lot of rules. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it can be constructive, but um, it also kind of dissuades people from staying in the shelter. They complain about the rules at the shelter and like there's no there's a no touching rule, which I get. You know, if you're if you have a lot of people that maybe don't get along, um, they're not necessarily friends. Someone told me about um, in a room with a lot of people in it, someone had some medical problem, fell to the floor and hit her head on the floor. And her friends rushed over and were like picking her up and the shelter employees were just yelling, no touching, no touching. And they're like, we need to help her. And they were trying to care for her and the policy was holding them back. Lindsay was telling me that although over a hundred people stay there every night, countless more um, choose to stay on the street. And she told me about how she stayed in a sleeping bag in a tent in a wooded area down the road. In the winter? Um, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I can't, like, I... Last night was zero or below. I can't believe that people would rather sleep in those conditions than at the shelter, but I, I, I've also heard that, and many people have confirmed to me that the shelters have a big problem with theft and violence, and that there's no respect for private property amongst the homeless, and some people just a few minutes ago were telling me about how the last time we um, gave out backpacks, there were a couple extra, and they brought them to the Homeless Services Center and found a guy that had been jumped the night before and all his stuff was taken from him. So they gave him a backpack. And that's that's really cool. Right. You know, it's not just uh, someone with their pockets inside out and they're going, I don't have anything. Somebody give me a, a handout. It's like this guy was 
uh, robbed of all of his possessions by a stranger for no reason. He barely even has anything. They took everything he had and our backpacks made it into his hands. I've been talking to people and bouncing off like some really um, really brave ideas of um, new things that we can do to actually try to get people off of welfare and um, really put our principles into practice in a serious, hardcore um, way. A lot of the work that we've done so far has been for people that are on government programs or qualify and we've been working with agencies that encourage people to get on government programs and, um, and I think like that's a, that's a giant disconnect. That's something that we realized with the first backpack delivery when we were talking to the folks that came out to get the backpacks is that they never even have considered anything other than welfare as a solution. So I've been toying with the idea of how we can get people who don't have job skills self-employed because anyone can start their own business and if, and if anyone's motivated or inspired or they just have that one thing that they can do really well they can do it for money why not you know that's that's something that so it's agorism in a sense and that's what so many porcupines do because we have that entrepreneurial self-starter motivated spirit I think we should pass that on I think it could be part of the solution to Great. the um, homeless problem so uh, Ridley would say that's a win-win solution yeah, I think so. Okay. But it's win-win when there are more uh, items available to buy on the market and people are making money and feeling good about themselves. And, and, and people are getting off the street and they're getting off the government dole. And even if they're only making like 10 bucks a month or something to start off with, with whatever they're doing, that's the thing when they go to bed at night, they're really proud. 